Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your host, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello, and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hey, y'all. It is season four, episode 48, and Austin, the Pittsburgh Steelers come away with a 20-13 to win over the Cleveland Browns in comeback fashion, overcoming a 10-0 deficit, and have improved their record to 7-5 and and are very much alive and still holding on to the number six seed in the AFC playoffs. Meanwhile, the Cleveland Browns dropped to 5-7 and seven and are, were already on the outside looking in, but their playoff hopes have been... Uh, almost dashed completely. Realistically, it's quite a tough hill for them to climb now. This was a huge victory for the Pittsburgh Steelers. It really was, and like you said, this really put an end to the Browns' like playoff run for this year. This best Browns team in the decade looks like they're not going to get farther than 8-8. Eight eight. I mean, they could actually finish the year 9-7. and seven. It's not out of the question, but it's still it's going to be tough to still make the playoffs with 9-7 and seven, uh, with this head-to-head loss. It hasn't been. It wasn't pretty, but neither has the entire season when it comes to the Steelers' victories. This one had a familiar starting script, and uh, Austin, we you talk about opening drives. The Steelers' uh, opening defensive drive gave up a field goal, and then on offense they went three and out and lost yardage. And they have only scored three points on opening drives this season. They've been outscored on opening drives to give you an idea of that. How bad it's been. The Los Angeles Rams scored a defensive touchdown in this, on the Steelers' opening drive, and the Steelers' only offensive points that they've scored came in Week 3 against the 49ers when they, I think it was an interception by T.J. Watt, set up the Steelers' offense. I think they gained like six yards on that drive, and it, it, that's the only reason they got points was because they started deep in San Francisco territory. So the offense, the starting, really, the way the team has started, but especially on offense, has just been horrendous. And it hasn't mattered if it was Ben Roethlisberger, Mason Rudolph, or now Devlin Hodges. It's just been all around really, really bad. It feels like a reflection of a game plan, like, coming in. Like, there's there's not good uh, game planning for the beginning of the game. The script that is starting off with that you end up throwing away after, like, the first few drives it just doesn't seem to be working. So I, I feel like this is a lot on, on Beekner. It might be a little bit on offense coming out slow because we've been accustomed to this for kind of – a, a while now where the offense just comes out slow uh usually in the entire first half but the the first like the first set of plays that's I, that I feel like is on Feetner. yeah I'm uh I'm actually going through right now because this has been a problem that's we've seen with this team for a while now even going back to the Todd Haley days but obviously he's not on the team so uh this is uh just I'm looking now at first quarter starts going back through the 2018 season and just going week by week, the Steelers' points in the first quarter read zero, zero. I'm just going week by week here. Six, zero, 13. They had a 13 burger against the Atlanta Falcons. They had zero against the Bengals, zero against the Browns, seven against the Ravens in Baltimore, uh, 21 against the Panthers on that Thursday night blowout win, zero against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Zero against the Denver Broncos. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, that's just that's most of last season. But you couple that with the way the Steelers have started, it almost doesn't really matter how they started their drives in the last few games of last year. This has been problems that we've seen with this team for you know multiple years now, and I think it does start with Randy Feigner. And I've already been over this with you that I think that there's reason to be optimistic that this can improve going into next year because Feekner has had a lot to deal with, with the rotation at quarterback, the rotation at running back, the rotation at wide receiver, making up for losing your top two skill position players for significant portions of the season and not having your Hall of Fame quarterback for most of the season. You know, you have to do some damage control. And Randy Feekner has not done a very great job this year. But given the circumstances, I'm willing to be a little forgiving, and I'm hopeful that next year he might be able to improve upon this and we might see his best year ever. I can say I'm as hopeful as you for it. Uh, I think that the 
Le Brown and James Conner in his Pro Bowl season. We saw how many zeros in the first quarter that happened. I, I honestly don't have the same hope. I think it's – I don't really know what the answer is. I can't say, like – this is why you shouldn't be hopeful, and here's the actual answer because I don't have it. I just don't have uh, I don't have that confidence because, like I said, last year you saw you read off all those zeros, and that was again with Antonio Brown and James Conner for the most part, anyway, uh, playing. So I, I well, here's I what we do know. I Juju Smith Schuster. Here's part here's, of that. You had a good wide receiver one and wide receiver two. Here's what we do know is that it can't get any worse. It is true. I it mean, really there can unless every game is. Is, is zero. I, I feel like every game has been zero this year anyway, though. Well, the, again, the only one we said, uh, they, they've been outscored 7-3 to three on opening drives this year <laughs> to give you an idea of how bad it is. And we're just talking about the Steelers' offense. Not the defense, just the offense. They're outscored 7-3 to three at this point. And uh, the last yeah. opening drive touchdown we saw was against the Patriots back in Week 15 last year. So not this week. Uh, assuming they don't score a touchdown this week, next the following week against the Bills will mark a full 16-game uh, season since the last time the Steelers had an opening drive touchdown. That's so terrible. I I hope that they can they can break that. Hopefully against the Cardinals or the the Bills. I believe we're also now at 20 straight games with a turnover. I think 19. I think I think uh, that that this past game was just 19. Well, regardless, uh, another turnover for the Steelers, and it didn't come back to haunt them too much. And I know we've been kind of all doom and gloom here at the start, but that is kind of how the game went. And when you were down 10 nothing, it really felt like the Cleveland Browns were in good shape to take uh, command of this game. The Steelers' offense had, I think, nine yards like halfway through the second quarter. And the defense, while it was bending and for the most part not breaking, the tackling wasn't very good. There were a few miscommunications that we saw. It was just uh, they weren't firing on all cylinders, and I think the the early score reflected that. But the Browns, it felt like they could have been up maybe 14 or 21 to nothing by the time the Steelers' offense got, got things going. Yeah, uh, luckily the defense did practice that bend-don't-break offense that uh, kept them in it. Uh, obviously the, the first drive where they gave up three points was good. Uh, the, the Browns had gotten a touchdown on three in three straight games on the opening try. So, I mean, the small victories there were – uh, where they were able to uh, stop them early on, but uh, what what's it called? Uh, the defense was pretty solid in this game. Besides the the tackling, I felt like the tackling was like the worst aspect of this game, especially on that Cream Hunt touchdown. Cream Hunt, uh, I watched the replay of that and I I saw how they opened it up. It's a really good uh, route for him. It was, it was really good, and but like he still should have been taken down before the uh, the end zone. That was really terrible tackling, and that kind of happened all day. There wasn't really good tackling anywhere. I felt like there was missed tackles on sacks. There was missed tackles there. There was just they were all over the place. Well, that uh, there were some good good ones, but that that yeah. long uh, that long reception by the tight end Car. I think it was a tight end Carlson that set up their first score. There were like three missed tackles on that one play alone. The Browns had a handful of explosive plays. I think they had uh, three in the passing game, but they also had two catches, uh, one to Landry and Odell Beckham that also went for 19 yards. So I mean, they don't go down as explosive plays, but I mean they they're right on the cusp there. So it's not like the Steelers weren't. Like, the defense wasn't perfect, but I think the other thing to remember is that that's kind of how defense is in the league these days. It's an offensive-minded league, so, I mean, you can't really can't really get super mad about it. I think the defense still overall did well. On that touchdown to Kareem Hunt, uh, from, what I was, from what I was seeing, it looked like Mark Barron bit on, uh, I don't, can't remember if it was a fake or if he bit on Mayfield that looked like he was going to run. I forget what happened, but it looked like Barron vacated a zone where Chubb, or not Chubb, but where Kareem Hunt ended up uh, being. It was either him or Mike Hilton. It's kind of hard to tell. Hilton got picked on a lot early in the game. He got thrown at later, but he I felt like he struggled a bit early. But he also had the toughest matchup of the day, I felt. Uh, I know Odell Beckham Jr. is the, probably the more talented receiver, but Landry's been more of the go-to guy this year. And you saw that in this game. I mean, he had six receptions, and uh, he led the team in receptions and yards and in targets. So he really is that guy for them over uh, Odell Beckham. So, I mean, I think Mike Hilton did have a pretty tough job. And things weren't looking good after the Browns went up 10 nothing. but 
just like what we saw against the Baltimore Ravens back in week five. Week f- yeah, week five. The the Steelers were facing, I think, a 10 nothing deficit against Lamar Jackson and the Ravens, and that's where we started seeing the Steelers' offense kind of open things up. We saw Mason Rudolph start to throw the ball downfield a little more, and that's what we saw here. We saw Devlin Hodges get the opportunity to sling it downfield a little more, and the key play was a uh, third and nine, nine at the Steelers' 18. That was Devlin Hodges' first deep shot of the game to James Washington on a free play. Barely got the feet down in bounds, but that 31-yard gain – really was the turning point for the Steelers' offense. Things got going from there. Uh, End around by Deontay Johnson picked up 17 yards, and although that drive ended in just three points, it really felt like things opened up as the Steelers scored a touchdown on the next drive, and that was uh, was James Washington's uh, signature moment so far probably of his career was that long touchdown catch, and he he was the catalyst uh, for an offense that, you know, only 20 points, but... It felt like his connection with Hodges was really the difference in this one. And that that really is probably more surprising uh, than anything, that it was Hodges to Washington and not Rudolph to Washington. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. You know, you would uh, you expect that, you know, Devlin Hodges' college connection to his uh, teammate James Washington, you know, when they both played at Samford. Oh, wait. they uh, James Washington played at Oklahoma State. Uh... Yeah, but uh, what's it? Uh, James Washington uh, was explosive in this game. He had two long catches, one for 44, one for, I believe, 31. It's 31 or 32. Um, I was, I'm was kind of mad, though. Uh, he keeps getting better every week, but if I made the bold prediction I made last week, this week, I would have hit it. And I, the last week's prediction was uh, the 100 yards and a touchdown. He finally went over 100 yards, but he's been improving every game. I believe three games ago he had 78 yards, which was his career high. Then he broke it, getting 98 and now here he is at 111 in this game. So he keeps getting better, and we're finally seeing what James Washington could be, what I thought he could be. I thought he could be the best wide receiver from this class, from his class, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, he's finally starting to show up. Maybe not getting that many catches, but when he's getting catches, they're effective, and you're seeing that show up and get it ability and all that stuff. So James Washington's been great over this three-game stretch. Yeah, he really has been. And I'm just looking back at his last five games. It really, you know, the last five games he's had, he's been targeted at least five times in each of those games. He came down with four against the Colts, six against the Rams. That was his first really good game. But actually, I think this really starts with that uh, that game against the Dolphins when he was a fantastic blocker. And yeah, you know, the blocking doesn't really have much to do with how he's running his routes, how he's catching the ball. But you know, it's been a huge confidence booster for him. And it's nice to see that he's finally arrived because he's been criticized relatively heavily for a Steelers receiver. And it's tough because he followed in the footsteps of what was the best rookie season by uh, by the what was the best season by a rookie, rookie wide receiver in Steelers history in Juju Smith Schuster in 2017. Had a relatively disappointing rookie season himself uh, in 2018. And it's taken about a year and a half. And, uh, you know, the quarterback play over that time has had a lot to do with it. But it's really nice to see that James Washington has arrived. That that deep threat that he's become, he's averaging, I think, uh, the last four or five games over 20 yards a catch, which is, you know, that's stuff that Mike Wallace did. And although they're, you know, very different types of players, Washington seems to have finally become that deep threat that we all wanted him to be. Yeah, man, he's just been great. Him and him and uh, really you know who has been impressing me uh he only had one tevin catch this game, but tevin jones yep. tevin jones coming on uh from the practice squad he's made a uh, big catch in both his games so far uh and i i he's kind of impressed me he actually had the second highest grade on offense uh for the pittsburgh steelers i mean he didn't get that many snaps i'm sure but i i kind of like tevin jones being on the roster over like johnny Hol- <laughs> johnny holton just uh I, I feel like he might have a good shot at staying on the roster going into next year, like active, because, uh, I mean, Johnny Holton's been bad. You could basically just get rid of him, and it's no difference, and then you could bring in another wide receiver. I think Jones could possibly stick on as, like, a depth guy. Well, I'm just, you know, that's uh, that we could get into a discussion about that, but what about Deion Kane? He only had one catch again this week, but... You know, less than, you know, I'd say even two weeks ago, maybe even last week, he could be having a conversation about the Steelers possibly, and maybe they still will, draft kind of like a speedster wide receiver in the later rounds of the draft. 
maybe you don't need to do that now. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you've got Washington, you've got Deontay Johnson, you've got Smith Schuster. Uh, those are three young guys that are going to be under contract. And then you've got Tevin Jones and Deion Kane. Uh, do you think that receiver could be a position where maybe they take a, a mid to late round flyer? Because I was thinking mid rounds, but now maybe you go later or not at all, possibly. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because you could have made an argument that wide receiver was, should have been one of the top needs. Like the the first pick in the draft that uh, Steelers have in the second round could have been dedicated to wide receiver, but we kind of slowed that down. And you kind of have like a bunch of guys here that that now are coming coming together, and this is they're coming together without Juju Smith Schuster right now. So that like it's only going to get better when. The, the top cornerback on the opposing team has to go to Smith Schuster, and now you have Washington and Johnson with better matchups, at least for the most part. I mean, sometimes that's just, it's not always how it works out, but you know, but honestly, it is a position they could avoid. I'm sure they'll still draft one. I feel like they get at least like one every year, even if it's like a seventh round guy. Uh, but they get like their Demarcus Harris, you know, like the, the late round guys. But I don't think it's a need necessarily anymore. It's more of a luxury now than it was, than it looked like it was going to be a week ago. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's a lot to make out of one game, but then again, it's not one game. We've seen we've seen consistent performances now from James Washington, and yes, Deontay Johnson struggled, and we can get into that, but he's a rookie. He's going to go through his growing pains, and even though Johnson really did struggle, I think he had two penalties, and he had a few dumb plays. He did make his two positive plays important, even if one of them you can kind of nitpick, but... Uh, you know, I think the good thing is that even on a rough day for Deontay Johnson, he still had two two big plays that were important to the outcome of the game. Oh, yeah. I mean, you wish he had a little bit better time catching. He was targeted five times and only caught one for 14. But that, uh, ru- that rush, that 17-yard rush came right after he made a big mistake. So he made up for that a little bit. And then uh, he had that 14-yard grab, as I said. So... He is going through the growing pains. Uh, I am still upset about the interception. I guess, you know, I thought about it, and I don't know if I necessarily could put it on him. It could have been a curl, and he just didn't realize. And then when he started running forward, he thought that uh, it wasn't interceptable when uh, when he gave up on the play, it looked like. But it's just still – it's just sour taste in my mouth for that. Like, I, I want him to run forward and be able to, like, take the guy down or at least try to, and he's just, like – jogging out there and then he's like oh wow that actually can be intercepted and then like got blocked out of the play so but uh other than that it's just going through the growing pains uh and he did a you, little bit below average at the end of the day but he had some good plays you never want to question an, a, an athlete's motivation or effort on plays but the first like uh, upon like first glance the first time you look through you might think oh like he didn't give it his all in that play but it's quite clear there was miscommunication. I'm not sure who was at fault there. Obviously, Tomlin's not going to throw a guy under the bus, but they seem to both be not necessarily pointing the finger, but obviously they both thought that something else was going to happen on that play. Yeah, we'll never really know if, if Duck thought it was a different play or if Deontay Johnson ha- had the right play or, or what happened here. But, uh, yeah, so we'll just never really know. Not a great day from the tight end statistically, but they both came up with important grabs. Vanette had a seven-yard catch that went for a first down, and McDonald had two big ones, or actually uh, he had a long uh, 12-yard catch. That was a third and 15, though, but he did have a crucial first down that forced the Browns to take their remaining timeouts, and you'd still like to see the tight ends get more involved, but, I mean, I guess something is better than nothing because we've seen nothing for the better part of a month. I was still disappointed. Vance had two false start penalties, and I wanted to, like, uh, seeing every false start penalty by wide receivers and tight ends in this game made me want to, like, kill myself a little bit. Uh, It was a ridiculous amount of penalties, and two came from Vance McDonald, so I'm still not exactly happy with the tight ends because, like, okay, now they contribute, but now you're losing yards based on penalties, and it's just... I don't know. Uh, I th- I will give Vance the uh, that third and six where he was able to pull guys across the line and get there for the first down. I give him props for that. The rest of it, I just I, I need to see more from the tight ends. They need to be better for a guy that was traded for and a guy that was supposed to, that has been so good in the past and just kind of like disappeared. Yeah, and uh, th- let's uh, you know transition a little more into those penalties. The Steelers had 10. I want to say eight of them were pre-snap, and uh, I think that means – I don't think they were all false starts. Some of them were like illegal formation, but 
the two on Deontay Johnson, in my opinion, I, I'll always say that wide receivers should never have a false start penalty because they're supposed to be looking at the ball. Uh, those are unforgivable. For the tight end, it's a little different because some sometimes they're splitting out wide and they're playing like a receiver. In that case, it's unforgivable. But when you're playing on the line, it's the same thing as an offensive lineman. It still shouldn't happen, but I'm willing to understand that a little more. But the fact of the matter is there are too, there have been too many pre-snap penalties for the last three weeks now. And for a team that early on in the year was one of the one of the top five teams in terms of penalties and penalty yardage, uh, they've really struggled in that area lately. And I'm not sure what to make of that, but Tomlin acknowledged that as a serious problem in his press conference today, and I have to think that that's going to be an going to be a concerted effort and a focus in practice this week to eliminate those mistakes there were also some that were very very nitpicky i can think of two oh, yeah. right off the mm-hmm. top of my head bud dupree at the end of the game getting that uh roughing the passer penalty that was very nitpicky and then even this one he is not nitpicky this is just bad it was made the up devlin hodges <laughs> false start penalty that didn't happen that was just randomly called for no reason that nearly uh, uh, that just kind of ruined a good offensive drive. I just uh, I was so mad. I was so mad about the Devlin Hodges one. At least the Bud Dupree one. It's like, well, no, 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 no. That's that's no, no, no. Because here's I, here, I here's why too. though. I thought it was really really bad call. But like, it's just the Devlin Hodges one. There was nothing there. Like you're talking about something like, well, maybe from this angle it looked like sort of like the Devlin Hodges one. There was nothing. There, there, like nothing happened. Yeah, I still have no idea what that was about. But my my whole uh, spiel here, my uh, no, 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 is about the fact that the hit on Mason Rudolph was later than the one. You know, the one at the end of the game two weeks ago was later than the one that Bud Dupree laid, and that was not flagged. That's my main gripe. Not to throw gas on the fire that's almost down and dead, but that's my main complaint from that. I don't. I get wanting to protect the quarterback, and I'm fine with that, but if you're not going to find Miles Garrett for a hit that was later than that, because Bud Dupree hit him like as soon as he let go of the ball. So, but that they being said... Take his injury into account? Do you think that, that they're like, well, they, they take Baker Mayfield's hand injury that he had suffered earlier? in the game like that's why they're so Mm, i think it has more to do with the fact that he's baker mayfield and mason rudolph is mason rudolph fair enough that that is fair i mean i hate to say it but i think that's true right I, i think so i think you're right but all that being said i the one i am still more upset about at the end of the day is that false start penalty on devlin hodges because they absolutely made it up there's nothing there a- absolutely nothing and it I, i'm literally i was i remember it because i was like on twitter we're getting ready to say oh wow is that devlin hodges or is that ben rothsberg out there getting the defense to jump off sides like as a joke and then they're like false start and i was like i i delete the tweet i was like oh, what excuse me i was because uh, like i could have sworn that the defense jumped off sides somehow magically they saw they, I don't know. I don't even know what they saw. They saw Devlin Hodges move forward or something. I have no idea what actually happened. I hope he speaks to the media uh, tomorrow, and maybe he can shed some light on that because I'm, I'm very curious on what happened there. Yeah, or maybe the NFL officiating account will come out and explain what happened, explain why they called it or say it was a bad call. That's just ridiculous. They'll never do that. Oh, they'll never admit that they made a mistake. They don't comment on plays like that, <laughs> on plays where they were obviously wrong. But uh, uh, anyways, we're getting a little off track here. Uh, Steelers offense, you know, the numbers, again, were not great, but they did. They made the plays that they had to. The ground game, you know, two weeks ago against the Browns, the Steelers had a virtually lifeless rushing attack where Mason Rudolph led the team in rushing for the most part. I think he was the second-leading rusher. This time around, you know, it was a host of guys. It was Jalen Samuels. It was Benny Snell, uh, a big play from Deontay Johnson, a little Kareth White sprinkled in. And the overall numbers, you know, under four yards a carry, but, you know, it was good enough to get the job done, and I think that's really all you can ask for right now considering where this offense was just two weeks ago. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing improvement. I mean, they only put up 20 points, but, like, it was still a pretty good showing, and to me it was a quality win when you're playing against – 
uh, you never make excuses, but and this is exactly what this game was. It was beating Browns and the refs no matter what. They were beating everything that was thrown at them. Uh, I think that the offense could get, could get better going on from here. Granted, there is some questions because uh, the Browns were ridiculously banged up in this game. So maybe the offense only performed so well because of that, because they were... Uh, they had lost the depth corner immediately. Then they lost Chad Thomas, one of the defensive ends. Then they lost Sheldon Richardson for a few plays. Uh, they lost Olivier Vernon in the game. He only played like a few staffs and then was gone. They were already without uh, Miles Garrett too. Not that, you know. Garrett for this game. Yep. I mean, just so, are all so around. Consider as well, but I feel good about the offense going forward. Yeah, just all around, you know, you can only play against who you, can, you know, who you're lined up to play against, so. You know, at the end of the day, I think the thing that we're most happy to see is the fact that there was considerable improvement from last week and two weeks ago. And what does that mean going forward against Arizona? You know, we'll see, but progress is progress. And for an offense that has struggled for most of the season, uh, you'll take what you can get. And, you know, the 20 points doesn't look great, but, hey, you have to remember, all these point totals, you have to divide them by three because the first quarter doesn't count because the offense doesn't show up in the first quarter ever. Yeah, they, don't, they don't know that there's a game playing yet. They're just trying to figure it out. They're just watching the defense, seeing what they do. They're like, oh, wait, so that thing that's across from the defense, that's what we're supposed to do? Got it. And then they come, then they come in in the second quarter. And uh, as things turned around for the offense, they kind of did for the defense as well around the same time. They were still playing okay, but they tightened things up a little bit. Uh, the Browns still finished with a nice you know, rushing attack overall, but I never really felt like the Steelers were getting gashed sans a few plays. Uh, you know, There were a couple of drives where it felt like the Browns were getting going, but they just couldn't punch it in. And they held Baker Mayfield and Odell Beckham Jr. largely in check in this one. And uh, you know, a lot of credit goes to the defensive front again, especially the outside linebackers, T.J. Watt and Bud Dupree. Excuse me who combined for two and a half sacks in this one and uh, three tackles for loss in this one. Those guys were completely dominant in this one. Bud Dupree with another crucial strip sack turnover that Cameron Hayward recovered. The Steelers, again, I I feel like this is kind of a, you know, the magic numbers that we should be looking for with this defense. Uh, Would you agree with me that if the Steelers finish a game with around four sacks and two turnovers forced, they should be able to win most of the time? I feel like, yeah, I feel like 80% of the time you should be winning that game. Well, they had, uh, I believe they had two last week and four sacks, right? Uh, I don't remember on the sacks, but yes. they had four. They had four sacks for sure. I wasn't sure about how many turnovers they forced last week. I'm pretty confident on the two turnovers. And I'm I'm 100% confident on the sacks. I remember that. And th- today they had, or this this week, they had five sacks and two turnovers, and they got another win. So obviously that's not the only thing that matters, but they got the job done, and it starts with those guys on the edge, and obviously Cameron Hayward and Javon Hargrave doing what they do up the middle, and uh, the defensive backs, you know, continuing to play well. Steven Nelson shutting down Odell Beckham Jr. after Beckham Jr. had a not a big game, but a huge catch two weeks ago. Uh, Mike Hilton making a couple nice plays. He had a nice breakup on, I think, Jarvis Landry on a deeper pass late in the game. And, of course, how could you forget the way the game ended with the Browns down seven trying to either tie the game or win the game in the waning minutes or seconds, really. The former Cleveland Brown and former pro bowler for them, Joe Hayden, comes up with a game-sealing interception. Uh, That's one he'll remember for a long time. And really just an emphatic statement uh, play there as the Steelers, although they split the season series, it was another reminder that the Steelers are the Steelers for a reason and the Browns are Brown are the Browns for a reason too. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, uh, this is another week where I was so upset. Uh, last week, I, I already mentioned it, James Washington, my, that bowl prediction was off by two yards. This one, Bud Dupree had his second sack. He had it, and he just missed the sack. He missed, and he would have had two and a half sacks and that forced fumble or that strip sack that I had predicted, I was so upset. I, I was like, I am so close. Someone else got the, the sack. I believe I believe that was Hargraves, uh, if I remember correctly. But I was still so like upset about because like that was my that was my bold prediction. I would have had it right there. But anyway, uh, as a whole, the defense did uh, great. There's some good. Uh, there's some good. 
from almost everyone, and there was some bad from a few. I thought Edmonds kind of had a, a struggling game, but uh, like I said, there's good in everyone. Edmonds made a great like open field tackle on Kareem Hunt for a loss, or I think no gain actually. But if he didn't make that tackle, it would have been open field for like 10 yards, and that would have been a big game for Kareem Hunt. Uh, he made that good tackle, I remember. Cameron Hayward, I thought, had a really good game. Javon Hargrave also had a really good game. Steven Nelson continues having great games. I mean, Mark Barron's been not so good, and I can't remember a play where he's specifically good, but he did okay. Minka almost had his in this game. Minka almost uh, had another one. He was uh, he was quiet, in quotes, in this game, but he almost had one that was probably going to the hell- house. Uh, and then, obviously, T.J. Watt was just destroying uh, Chris Hubbard. I guess familiarity uh, on the second time was... His, uh, poor Chris Hubbard doesn't want to deal with his old teammate, man. That that It's just tough. Yeah, it's not fun. It's like, you know, congratulations on your new contract, Chris, but uh, now you get to play against T.J. twice a year instead of going up against him in practice. I'm sure he liked him a lot better in practice than he did, <laughs> did in games, you know? <laughs> And TJ, sure. TJ's had a sack in every game he's ever played against the Browns. I think it's nine career sacks and now six games. That, rem- that first game against the Browns is still, like, one of the best performances. Didn't he have two sacks and an interception, or was it one sack and an interception? I, th- I think they technically gave him, like, one and a half. I remember he definitely had at least one. They gave him a second one, but there was, like, a penalty on the play, so, like, they counted it. I forget. It was weird like that. But they gave him that, and he obviously had his first career interception – uh, yeah, it was quite the coming out party for him, and it was uh, it was obviously a big deal. And it's funny because he's still dominating the Browns, but he's such a better player now than he was then. Not that he wasn't good then, but remember, he was a lot more of a raw prospect then. He wasn't a dominant pass rusher. He was mostly an effort kind of guy at that point who was just a freak athlete and didn't have much developed uh, you know, pass rushing moves per se. I mean, there's a reason why he went 28th overall. I mean, redoing that draft, he's not going outside the top five, but there's a reason why he was uh, taken 28th uh, in that draft. And, I mean, it worked out for the Steelers, and he's been great. And even as a, even as a rookie, he did uh, pretty solid. for. Uh, he actually did great for a rookie, and now he's just getting better. He's now an elite pass rusher. Like, I think he's in – I think he could be in that, that talk that he is an elite pass rusher, and he could be in the talk show defense player of the year. I think he absolutely should be. And remember we were talking about, uh, oh, I, I'm completely blanking here. Actually, I think Watt went a little bit later because I think the Steelers were picking later in that draft because they went to the AFC Championship the year before. Oh, I'm remembering. Oh, this is when they picked 30. I'm sorry. It's only a couple picks. But the point being is that, like, you look at all the guys, you look at all the edge rushers that we looked at that year. Like Derek Barnett was my personal favorite. I remember Takaris McKinley was your favorite guy. Uh, there were a handful of guys. Solomon Thomas. Uh, I'm I'm blanking on a couple others, but there were a ton of edge rushers taken in that first round, and so they've had varying degrees of success. But I don't think any of them has, have been nearly as good as T.J. Watt has been, and he's been. Uh, you look at the numbers. I was I'm remembering now. It was a list of guys who've had the most sacks through their first, like, three seasons of their careers, and TJ's, like, top six. Uh, one of the guys that has more is JJ, and, uh, you know, he's just been fantastic, and he's just – he's one of the most dynamic edge rushers I've seen in a long time for the Steelers, probably the best since James Harrison. And you want to talk about James Harrison, his single-season Steelers record for sacks is 16. TJ is just three and a half behind that right now with four games to play. Yeah, he's doing amazing. He's doing great. Uh, hopefully, I'm hoping, I'm rooting for him to beat James Harrison's single season sack record uh, for sure for the Steelers. I mean, uh, he's just been great, and you can't really say enough about it. Like he's been one of the best uh, guys drafted out of out of that uh, class, and definitely one of the best ones out of that first round. I mean, uh, that was actually a really solid draft. I'm like looking through it now, like not for uh, edge rushers, but I was looking at some o- of the other players taken and just. There are some good players, but he definitely is easily the best uh, line, uh, edge rusher that came out of the first round, for sure. Like, looking at all these guys, like, there's some guys that I don't even know have played yet, like Charles Harris for Miami Dolphins. I I've, I've, don't even know if he's played yet. I, I've never heard his name. He's never done anything. There, there's Tack McKinley, who I loved. Uh, Taco Charlton was a, a defensive end, but, I mean, he was bad, and, I mean, 
then you have TJ Watt at 30, and yeah, it was just really, really good. Uh, he's probably one of the best ones out of that draft class, so. Yeah, I'm just looking at other names, and I'm not seeing not seeing really anyone that's standing out like There's that. There's no yeah. one impressive, no one that's kept it going for a while. I mean, like, I still I like Tech McKinley, but he has not done anything, like, consistently. He had a three-set game for the Falcons. Like, he ha- he's flashed what I thought he was going to be, which is amazing. But he's not done it consistent on a consistent level at the NFL, and he's just not always there. Like, the three-set game is nice, but, like, what would you want? One three-set game every, like, 10 games or would you want like a, a sack every game of the year like i i don't know why i want the sack every game what is also one sack off his career high of i think 13 13 and a half that he had last season so he's in pretty good shape right now uh and that's not to say enough about bud dupree who's been uh darn near equally as great uh on the other side and he's not quite as flashy and uh you know he doesn't have as big of numbers but he has a career high in sacks now with uh eight and he's i think tied for fifth in the league in forced fumbles and he's had two or he's had three now two against the Bengals and one against the browns now that have been crucial and we need to have a serious conversation now about the fact that he has you know in a contract year he's turned it on so much and we've talked about the depth behind him I, I don't really see how you can't do whatever you can to bring him back next season. Really got to try. I mean, you know what I was thinking about? And uh, I'm just, it, I was playing devil's advocate with myself. I, I didn't even have this conversation with anyone. But in a way, I almost, if the Steelers can't pay Bud Dupree, I will be okay. And what made me think, think of this was I was looking at the sack totals posted by Steelers Depot, right? And I just, uh, in the game, Javon Hargrave had just passed Stephon Tewitt uh, in sacks on the year. Uh, Tewitt finished with three and a half before he went on IR. And that's what makes me feel okay. Because you might not have that outside linebacker pass rusher anymore, but Tewitt was also having a career year. And, I mean, I guess you're betting on that happening again, but that's like kind of the same thing. You're betting on Bud Dupree doing it again when this is Bud Dupree's first, like, real breakout year. So if they can't pay Bud Dupree, I'll be okay. But I, that being said, I would like them to pay Bud Dupree and just have the nastiest defense. Why can't you have Tuit and Bud Dupree back to play defense for the Steelers? And, and uh, I have them both. I, I, it's going to be rough to run the numbers. I think Vance McDonald's got to go. I think he's going to be a big uh, – because he has one of the biggest contracts that you could kind of be okay with uh, getting rid of. Mark Barron as well, Anthony Ciccolo as well. Uh, it's just you're gonna have to get rid of a bunch of people to make room for, uh, for that kind of contract, but I think you can make it happen. Uh, and then you probably like put some money towards like next year, like you move some contracts. I'm forgetting the word for it, but you know what I mean. Like you make the money going to the next year, so you open up cap space. You're talking about yeah, restructuring. restructuring, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, so th- they'll probably have to do that as well. I think it's possible though. The one thing I wanna, I'm not to poke too many holes in your argument argument but the whole uh, Stefan to argument that you brought up you know he just had a breakout year of his own this year uh you know he's flashed before too but would you really be safe betting on him to you know duplicate that as well if you're not going to bet on Bud Dupree I, I don't know that's that's what I'm saying I was saying like you're bet you're really betting on both because uh, I don't know if this was Bud Dupree playing out of his mind because it's a contract year and I'll never do this like ever again uh, it's just, uh, but I, I have confidence it will happen. But like also t- with two, it's just like, well, he suffered another, uh, he suffered another injury. He tore his, uh, bi- was it bicep or tricep, it, or was it neither? Was it? It was. Pack? It was pack. He tore his. Uh, I think it was pack. either his bicep or tricep back in like 2017. That was a previous injury. And that's why I'm getting confused. I'm uh, so with the torn pack. You don't know if he'll come back from the injury as strong as he was. I mean, you kind of as a defensive end need to be able to push. I think he'll be okay because like, Hayward had that same injury and then he followed that up with a career year. I'm not saying that that will always happen, but I I think that it's proven that yeah. you can come back because Bud Dupree had a pack injury too and he's having a career yeah. year, so you can the, do it. The as point well. is, it's a gamble with whoever you go with for the most part. Exactly. Yeah, and I I don't think that we're I think that we're just kind of trying to outline concerns and possibilities of why you might have to move on and like the complications of if you do bring him back. But I mean, let's, let's be honest. We both would like to have him back if we can, it's easier said than done, but we'd like to have him back. Yeah. Ideally you, tr- you try and trade 
I mean, if you could get anything for Mark Barron, you you do it. If you could trade Vance McDonald, which I think is more likely, I think you would be able to actually get something for Vance McDonald. I think you should do it. I mean, it's going to be tough because then your tight end position is even worse than we thought it would be going into next year. But, I mean, it some, it's, would be a position that you actually have to probably draft or get a cheap one on the tight end market. But it's one of the positions where it's like, well, is the drop-off going to be that much different now with what uh, what he's done this year? Let me, That's why I think he's going to be a cap casualty. Let me kick you a scenario. Say you are able to trade Vance McDonald and Jesse James gets cut. Would you be comfortable rolling into next year with Jesse James and possibly re-signing Nick Vanette as your 1A, 1B? Down for that. I am 100% down for that. I think that would be actually okay. Because, I mean, I don't know if Jesse James is going to be available in the market, but like in your scenario, he will be. Uh, I think that I, I would be okay with this. The problem is how much do you pay Vanette? How much does Vanette want? Uh I'd be down with that, though. Obviously, we're talking a lot of hypotheticals here, but look, having Bud Dupree back would be huge, and I would, the way I see it, and I've already explained this to you, I've told you this, the Steelers' Super Bowl window is going to be open for two more years. I understand not wanting to mortgage the future, but we've already seen unlikely or uncommon moves from the Steelers in the past calendar year. Trading a fifth rounder for a number two tight end, trading a first round pick to get uh, to get Minka Fitzpatrick trading up in the draft into the top ten to select Devin Bush, who, by the way, uh, you know we've he's been kind of quiet at least uh, compared to how what he was doing earlier in the season. He's still playing very well. I, I don't want to like he's he hasn't been perfect, but he's been kind of flying under the radar and he's been solid. And I just I wanted to point that out that I think he's been he's been as advertised this year, even if those. Even if he didn't have a splash play this week, he did last week too. He's still doing just fine, and I'm very happy that he's on the team. Uh, I mean, he led the team in tackles this this week, and he had a tackle for a loss. They still have some problems. Like he's not perfect. Uh, we weren't expecting perfect. He's a rookie, uh, and he has a lot of the same problems Ryan Shazier did when he played. Uh, and in this game, we saw him overrun uh, his gap a little bit in the run game. So we saw him struggle there. But, I mean, overall, he's still doing great, and especially for a rookie. He's fit in perfectly, and he's been involved in so many turnovers. Maybe not in the past uh, few games, but, I mean, he's been playing great. And I expect him only to get better going, uh, from here. Remember, it took Ryan Chazier almost two full seasons to come into his own, and Devin Bush is far ahead of that curve right now. And like we have said, it's the thing that Shazier frustrated uh, us with. It's the fact that he will over-pursue sometimes, but it's that athleticism that does it for him. And, you know, as frustrating as it is, you'll take that because he does make so many plays in the backfield. He does make those plays that so few other players can make. That's why you draft those guys. Man, when you know a guy's going to be good, you go and grab him. And they grabbed a guy that was even ahead of where Shazier was when he was drafted, like you said. But anyways, the, the point I'm making here is that the Super Bowl window only being open a couple more years, you do what you have to do, mortgage the future if you have to, uh, as the Steelers have a bit already, to get guys that are going to make a difference. And we've seen for the first time, they drafted eight straight first-rounders on the defensive side of the ball. Make make those guys count. Brick, keep them as, for as long as you can. If you have to franchise tag Bud, I'd do it immediately. I would I would do that, and I understand that maybe you have to cut someone like a Ramon Foster or a Vance McDonald, Mark Barron. Well, you know, we can go into details about that at the end of the season. I think you have to do that to keep this defense intact because this defense is the best that we've seen since the last time the Steelers went to the Super, Super Bowl. They've got the pass rush. They've got the secondary. They've got the linebackers. And without a first-round pick next year, we know about the difficulties in – being able to replace edge rushers unless you usually have a top pick and the fact of the matter is sometimes you can get them later like tj watt but it took about a full year for him to get to where he was a impact player at all times and on the offensive side you'll have your hall of fame quarterback back and uh you know well you'll have holes there but that's a problem for another day maybe the one thing i will say about tight end is that drafting one as you know was the case with someone like a uh Zach Gentry is that they're usually not able to make much of an impact in year one like look at TJ Hawkinson with the Detroit Lions I I thought he played well this season but he's going to finish the year with 32 catches you know not a not a big time contribution yeah he was he was good just not uh tight end doesn't 
tight ends don't really contribute that much. I feel like, especially early on, like it's just kind of there's kinda a learning curve in the beginning. When if you're not like an elite one right from the get go, like you're not going to be contributing that much until a few, uh, year or two later. Because that's the thing with tight ends. Because back in the day, tight ends were glorified offensive linemen that could catch passes. If they contributed anything in the passing game, it was seen as a bonus. But now the problem is. So many teams in college basically they're basically wide receivers that are just big and slower. You know, they can still you know, they're big athletes, they make plays. But teams sometimes you know, it, it's tough for them to adjust to learn how to block, to play in line, or to be used in different very because a lot of these college offenses are simple. NFL offenses for the most part aren't. So there is a learning curve, and I think that we've seen that with guys around the NFL like Irv Smith, Noah Fant, TJ Hawkinson. It takes time, and that's why drafting one early can be seen as questionable. Even if you know, even Rob Gronkowski, his first season, I think he only caught thirty-nine passes. And that should be that should be point proven enough. When Rob Gronkowski considered one of the best tight ends, like of the decade ever. Uh, if, if yeah, ever, I should. I, I don't know why I said of the decade. It's just I was thinking of Tony Gonzalez. That's why. It's like uh, uh, it's just he's one of the best tight ends to ever do it. He only had 39 catches in his first year. Like you, you could tell that like a tight end is more of a developmental position comparatively. I'm double checking that now because I want to make sure I was correct. Rob Gronkowski, 2010, 42. So I was three catches off. Snuff. Still not that many compared to what he's done. And that was also at a time when the Patriots were still throwing the ball a ton too. So, you know. That uh, that is the point. But uh, you'd franchise tag Bud right away, like if you had the opportunity to, right? Yeah, I'm clearing up that money and franchise tag you. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing we didn't get to with this game: special teams. I thought they did a pretty good job in this one. They had good punt coverage. Uh, Cam Kelly had a couple nice plays. Uh, Johnny Holton had a nice tackle. Chris Boswell was perfect again. Jordan Berry uh, continues to have another good. Uh, uh, actually, we'll get to that later. He's having an elite season for a punter. And, uh, you know, uh, the kick return game, actually, a big 34-yard return from Kareth White. It was the only good return we saw all day, but uh, it gave us a, a glimmer of hope, something that we haven't seen from this kick return unit in, uh, well, ever. Uh, starting next week, Kareth White, uh, Dion Kane, and Tuzar Skipper can be cut from the team, but I have doubts that any uh, – that White or uh, – White or Kane are going to be going anywhere. Uh, White, I feel like, has done decently in his time. This is, I mean, he showed his worth on offense, where he could be that speed back that the Steelers really haven't had in a while. He showed some worth on special teams, where he got, excuse me, he got that like one, uh, he he got that one long return, a thirty-four yard return that got them a, a, a past their forty, and you see like he's flashed, and it's just been pretty good for him, and then. Like you said, the rest of the special teams is actually pretty solid. Um, what's it called? Oh, uh, I shall let you take over because you have something something importante. Yeah, according to both Bleacher Report and ESPN, the Carolina Panthers have fired head coach Ron Rivera. Wow. Okay. That's actually kind of surprising. I'm surprised they didn't wait till after the season. Yeah, apparently they've had enough after nine years. Remember, former Steelers minority owner David Tepper owns the team. He purchased uh, the team when Cam Newton and Ron Rivera were both already there. So those aren't his guys. Uh, for now, interim head coach is going to be Perry Fuel, who I actually remember because he was formerly a <laughs> he was a former interim head coach with the Buffalo Bills when one of their coaches was fired. So, uh, you know, oddly enough. Uh, Perry's going to have his second go around as an interim. I wonder if he ever wants, if he's thinking, like, can I ever get a head coaching job, like a real one these days? But yeah. I bet he is. He's like, yo, guys, I've done it twice. Let me let me get a, re- let me get a real shot at it. He's got a really <laughs> cool name, though, Perry Fuel. Yeah, I lo- a cool I, name. It might be Fuel, but I, I, I lo- I've always, I thought it was always Perry Fuel. I'm seeming to remember it that way, but I could be wrong. But Riverboat Ron is out. It uh, could be a new era for the Carolina Panthers, who've lost four straight, and Cam Newton, at, you know, at, the, at a crossroads now. Uh, do you think Ron Rivera's done? I have a feeling he'll land on his feet somewhere. I just don't know where. I feel like he could get somewhere. I mean, he, he's, pro- he's probably an improvement over Adam Gase or Freddie Kitchens. You say probably. You know? Oh, how could it not be? 
Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's just going to be – he's going to land somewhere. It might not be as a head coach in the first year, but I think he will actually be getting a head coaching job. How about Washington, the team that he just lost to? And uh, it's a possibility as well. So very interesting uh, – uh, you know, an interesting development. The Panthers, man, when Cam Newton went out, they caught lightning in a bottle for a little over a month, and now they've fallen back to earth. It was, uh, it's was it been a strange year for them. It really has been. They, like, lost a few in a row, and then they won so many in a row. Like, what, one came back and won four in a row after uh, Cam Newton got hurt. It's just weird up-and-down year for them. You know what's interesting? I'm now just realizing this. Perry Fuel, to my knowledge, I'm going to double-check this because I want to make sure. Perry Fuel. He, was he ever a head coach? He was an interim head coach for the Bills in 2009 when they fired Dick Duran. He's never been a head coach officially, like, for a team. Very interesting because you know who else is on their staff is Norv Turner, and he was previously the head coach of the Chargers. So I find it interesting that they decided to go with Perry instead of Norv Turner for the interim head coach. I guess they just don't trust Turner. I, I, I don't know. That's kind of weird. Yeah, very, very bizarre. But anyways, uh, I guess uh, it's not that big of a deal for us. But just some breaking news I wanted to uh, bring up because it is a significant firing. Uh, he's the second head coach to be fired uh, this season with joining Jay Gruden of the Washington Redskins. So uh, whoever the, if the Panthers beat someone else uh, this year, then that coach should be concerned because it seems to be the trend. The Redskins fired their coach, then they beat the Panthers, and then the Panthers fired their coach. So I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess it's something to monitor. Uh, what were we talking about before? Before talking about special teams. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did you have any further thoughts? Because uh, I, I, you were talking about Kareth White and the kick returning. Uh, just that the rest of the uh, special teams is pretty good. Kareth White uh, sh- flashes some upside, and that Jordan Barry and Chris Boswell continue to be great, having probably their career years, to be honest. Mike Tomlin also mentioned Robert Spillane as a guy that was uh, that has been contributing for the team on special teams in his press conference today, so just wanted to highlight that as well. After he had a rough start where he had two penalties in his first game, I think. Um mm. Oh, uh, just one last thing that I was thinking about. I saw that Tr- uh, Trey Edmonds was the fullback on Benny Snell's first career rushing touchdown, and that uh, he actually like went out and blocked someone. So I wonder if we're going to see more of that going forward. It'd be cool. Gives Trey Edmonds a way to stay on the roster for a little bit longer up until like next year. So that's good for him. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not in love with Trey Edmonds as far as, you know, what he does. I think he is kind of a practice squad kind of guy, but I just like what he brings to the team. I like his ability. I think he's a good special teamer, and I think he's kind of a versatile guy. I like having him around. Uh, yeah, I'll keep him around. Uh, any further thoughts on the game? I mean, obviously a huge game. Uh, the Steelers split the season series with the Browns. The Browns, you know, you know, not a lot. You know, we didn't make a, a huge deal about the – wearing the Pittsburgh started at shirt from Freddie Kitchens, but obviously it's gained a lot of traction since the Steelers won. Uh, a couple players, Ramon Foster, said that Mike Tomlin would never do that, and David DeCastro basically said that it was stupid for Kitchens to do that. And, look, I think I agree. I think it's a bit overblown, but the fact of the matter is the optics are bad, and like I said the other day, it just looks stupid, and for that reason it is stupid. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty stupid. Alrighty then. Uh, Steelers 7-5 and five now. Let's move on to the rest of the games from Week 13 of the NFL season, starting with the New York Jets and Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals are off the schneid. Uh, they have pick up their first win of the season, now at 1-11. and 11. Andy Dalton plays hero ball for the Bengals, and Tyler Boyd catches a big touchdown pass. You know, the season's obviously over for the Bengals, but... Nice for them to not go down in history as one of the worst teams ever. I really felt like this was coming, though. Ever, once they started, they were starting Andy Dalton. It really felt like, yeah, this is where they get their one and possibly only win for the year is right here. And they came out and they did it. It was 22-6 uh, Cincinnati. And uh, I, can't, I really, oh, yeah, Jets made history. They're the only team uh, to lose to two undefeated teams uh uh, like the, with a worse than zero and six record in the same season, On, only team to do so. 
Oh, and seven actually, because they got it was the Dolphins were zero and seven, I think, and obviously the Bengals were zero and eleven. And I said it at the time, I was wary about picking the Jets, and I don't know why I did, because like you said, I kind of felt like this was coming, because I felt like the Jets, even though they've been playing better, I was kind of nervous about it, because Sam, I just don't trust Sam Darnold, and they got absolutely bullied by the Bengals, and that is just flat out embarrassing. It is rough to be a fan of one of those New York area teams right now. Yeah, man, it's not great. Speaking of those New York teams, the Giants and Snowy MetLife Stadium got the crap beaten out of them by the Green Bay Packers, who improved to nine and three on the season. Everyone was talking about like, oh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, you know, playing in the snow doesn't bother him. No, it shouldn't. He plays in Green Bay. I don't know why people were making such a big deal about that, but the Giants have lost their, I believe, eighth straight, eighth straight game. And uh, a lot of questions about Pat Shermer's job security now in question, seeing as how his record through, I think, 28 games, something like that, is like 7-21. and 21. Meanwhile, Ben McAdoo had a record of like just two games under 500 when he was fired. It's kind of interesting stuff. Uh, I thought that the Packers should have had a, a bigger spread in this game. I thought they only got 6.5 because they're on the road. I was like, that's kind of surprising. And, yeah, they came in and did what they – uh, what they should have done to this team. You think it's a, it's at all possible the Giants might start Eli Manning in one of their last couple home games as a farewell tour? Because I've heard that could be a possibility, and I think that would be, I think that wouldn't be the worst idea. Just because Daniel Jones is getting killed back there, that team sucks, and it would be a way to get butts in the stadium. Um, I, uh, I I don't think you should. I I feel like even if you call it just. Eli Manning's farewell tour. I just, I, I feel like you just, just ride with Daniel Jones, keep getting the experience. I mean, it might be bad experience, but it's experience. Indeed. Next game, well, as big as the this game was between the AFC North, the Browns and Steelers, there was a game equally as big in the AFC South, the Tennessee Titans and Indianapolis Colts. And if you were the Steelers, you were rooting for the Colts in this one, but they were unable to come through. The turning point. A long Adam Vinatieri field goal attempt was blocked and taken back to the house for the Titans, who come away with a 14-point victory, who are now 7-5 and five and tied with the Steelers for that last uh, AFC wildcard spot. The Steelers hold the tiebreaker, but the Titans have uh, a schedule that includes the Raiders, Texans twice, and the Saints. So uh, that the Titans are the team that I feel like the Steelers are going to be watching most closely over the final month here. Uh, the Titans impressed me in this game. They scored 24 unanswered in the, uh, starting from the third quarter. Uh, the Colts were up 17-7 early on in the third after scoring a touchdown and just never put up points after that. I heard Brissett really struggled. He threw two interceptions. Uh, I didn't really see the game. I was at work, and I saw Tannehill actually balled out. I mean, uh, also Derrick Henry has been on another level the past, like, three games. And really, and, uh, you look at his numbers, and he's had some really nice games. If you made, if you go back to his last 16 games, he's had a really nice season uh, if, if it were the past 16 games. So, I mean, Henry's kind of underrated right now, I feel like. But, yeah, the Titans kind of impressed me here. Remember, it was around this time last year he really turned things on again. He finished with a great statistical season last year, but – like over half of it came from his last five games, and here he is. He's just one of those guys that just gets better as the season goes on. He's just – he is a bull out there. Yeah, man. He's, uh, he's just so good. Philadelphia Eagles fall to 5-7 and seven at the hands of the Miami Dolphins in one of the greatest trick plays ever. The old flip from uh, the punter to the kicker on that strange formation – it was a trap, and the and the Dolphins caught the Eagles napping. It was the key play and a big upset win for the Dolphins, who, despite the three and nine record, are playing close football nearly every week. And it's really the spirit of Ryan Fitzpatrick and the ability of Ryan Fitzpatrick to keep that team in it. And Devontae Parker has finally become the player that the Dolphins thought that they were getting in the draft four years ago. I just can't believe how bad the Eagles actually are. I mean. Carson Winston played terribly. Uh, he still just didn't really finish with a great stat line. Touchdown and interception was great, fine, three to one. But like the twenty-eight for forty-six, he's been at inaccurate. He hasn't been playing well, and the the Eagles wide receivers have been like mostly disappointing. I mean, you saw Alshon Jeffrey finally uh, go off in this one again. 
But, like, after him, it's just really rough sledding. And then I, I just can't believe Miami was able to stick in this game and really give it to them that bad. It's just the Eagles secondary and defense is just that bad that they were able to allow 37 to Miami. Just incredible stuff. I can believe it because the NFC East is the worst division in football, and all four of those teams are bad. So crazy. The Redskins could still win that division. It's mathematically possible. Just Wouldn't that be... Let's not even entertain that right now. Uh, (laughs) The Buccaneers at the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Nick Foles era is over. Uh, The Buccaneers raced out to a 25-0 lead. And, uh, man, oh, man, uh, the Jaguars went from being in the race just a couple weeks ago to now looking lost as they could ever be. That game was ugly. That game was, like, really, really ugly. Uh, I just, uh, I, I thought that they made the, they should have never been Minshew in the first place, so I'm being honest. He's playing great. He's playing fine. He wasn't a reason why they were losing. And I know you paid Nick Foles all this money, but, like, I almost felt like this is happening. And Nick Foles confirmed can only play good for the Eagles. He's going to get cut this season, return to the Eagles as a backup, come back and start playing again because Carson Wentz gets hurt, and then he's going to be an MVP again. I don't know what the Eagles do to him, but he was never good on the Rams. He was never good on the, um, what's the other team? Not Jacksonville, the other one that he's, he's, he was on with other than the Rams. You don't think I'm gonna pick he was on the Eagles uh, twice, remember? Oh, but there was another team he was bad on other than the... Oh, the Chiefs. Uh, the, the Chiefs. The Chiefs, yeah, okay. Yeah, he... He was with the Chiefs for a little bit, I, but uh, so it's he's only good on the Eagles confirmed. Yeah, I mean, I, I I definitely get the criticism of Nick Foles this year. He is he's not been good. He's also only played ten quarters, and I actually don't think Gardner Minshew has been that great. He's just been okay. His QBR this season is twenty sixth in the NFL. It's not much better than Mason Rudolph's. I'm not saying that he's you know bad. I'm just saying I don't. I think the problems with the Jaguars run much further than just the quarterback. Yeah, there's a bunch of problems. I mean, their once elite defense is just like now just kind of trash, just kind of there. Like their defense, none of the pieces really changed besides Telvin Smith. But well, I was going to say just, Jalen Ramsey's gone now. I wonder how much uh, uh, that has affected them. I'm forgetting about that. But even when Jalen Ramsey was there, they weren't even doing that as good. Not compared to man, that season they had two years ago. It really was special. Looking back on it now, yeah, that defense was so good just two years ago. Like they were almost the AFC champions. <laughs> Even given how almost. bad Nick Foles was playing, he, he's still better than what Blake Bortles was. <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. Oh man, uh, next game we're moving on to. We already kind of talked about it a little bit, but the Redskins pick up their third victory of the season by beating the Panthers 29-21. to Panthers free-falling have just fired their coach. Redskins still mathematically alive for the division, even though they have, a t- I think, like a top-five pick right now. Wild times right now. It's a really, really wild times. But, I mean, what can you say? The, the Panthers really played down to their opponent in that game. That's really all you can say. The game of the week, which I'm kind of shocked was at 1 o'clock and wasn't thought about being flexed, but it was the Patriots on Sunday night, so I do get it. But in a rainy game, the Baltimore Ravens come out on top in a battle of heavyweights 20-17 to over the San Francisco 49ers. This truly was a great game. I enjoyed watching it. That was really a good battle. I mean, you saw both teams uh, be successful at times, and it almost looked like the 49ers could have won it. But uh, just the, uh, the Ravens were just able to squeak out. Not enough to cover but they were able to just squeak out with a victory on a Justin Tucker field goal. Yeah, I saw someone tweeting, like, will Tucker make this kick at the end? And I'm like, of course. Like, I mean, you and I know this because we've seen him so much. How could he miss? The only time he's ever missed a kick like that was that extra point against, I think, the Saints last year. And it was remember that meme of his face where he was so shocked? And I was like, that's how we're all feeling, man. Like, that dude is as automatic as they come. Yeah, man. He's, he has to be the best kicker in NFL history when it comes to just uh, accuracy. I've never I, – like, I remember he missed a kick against the Steelers in one game that I – because I saw them play the Ravens three years in a row. The one miss well, – <laughs> the one miss was a blocked kick or, like, a, a bad snap, I think. Yeah, something like that. Like, the dude just doesn't miss. He is – he's amazing. And then a year where kicking – Efficiency has gone down. He has been as good as ever. 
Uh, later games now, the Ra- here's one thing, here's one reason I ended up picking the Rams, Austin, and it's a rule that we should we should really think about considering. When a team with a relatively, you know, a relatively good roster and a good coach gets embarrassed in a game, especially a primetime game, they usually come out and play well the next week. And that was what happened with the Rams. Now, they did, they did win uh, against the Bears last week, but they didn't look good. They haven't looked good for a while. And they came out and they absolutely shellacked the Arizona Cardinals, who the Steelers play this week, 34-7. to I have no idea what happened. I was at work. I'm looking at the score, and I just see, oh, it's 20-0 to zero at halftime. Okay. Oh, the end of the third quarter, it's 34-0. to zero. Okay. Like, just, it was just absolutely disgusting. Like, I, I don't... I don't know what happened. I don't know how, how the defense played so bad for Arizona. Like, I, I I don't consider them that great of a defense. I like Chandler Jones, and that's about it. I, I, I like Chandler Jones and Jordan Hicks, I should say. But, like, I, I don't know. I wasn't expecting the Rams' offense to return to, like, last year's form like that. Yeah, it was definitely a surprise for sure. Uh, now into the 425 games, the Chargers uh, are swept by the Denver Broncos. Drew Locke with his first NFL start. It's a 23-20 victory for the Broncos. I don't really have much to say about this one. Not much to say either. I didn't really watch it. Two games between two teams that are out of it. And then uh, a crucial AFC West matchup that essentially has given the Chiefs the AFC West championship. They bludgeoned the Raiders 40-9. to The Raiders might have been fool- fool's gold after looking pretty impressive just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, this uh, victory for the Chiefs helped out the Steelers quite a bit more. Uh, and uh, Oakland's going to be struggling to try and get back into the playoff race again. Uh, I, I think they have a they have a somewhat hard schedule coming up, so I think they are basically out of it. But, I mean, who knows? Anything can happen. You're rooting for the Raiders this week and then not at all the rest of the way because the Raiders have the most conference games remaining among the rest of the teams. The I think the Titans have just... Uh, or wait, no, not the Titans, the Colts. You're rooting for the, the Colts mostly because obviously, A, the Steelers have the tiebreaker against them, but B, the Colts have just one game remaining against an AFC opponent. Three of their last four are against a non-conference. So you really want them to win games because their record wouldn't mean as much compared to the Steelers if they're tied. Meanwhile, the Raiders have four against the AFC, and I think the Titans have three against the AFC. So you're rooting for the Raiders this week, and then I think you're – rooting for the Raiders to lose the rest, kind of, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's all confusing, obviously, and it'll figure itself out. But uh, Steelers fans should be rooting for the Raiders over the Titans next week. Uh, Sunday night football, the New England Patriots and Houston Texans squared off, and the score was 28-22. It looked close, but uh, the Texans really dominated the game for the most part. The Patriots' offense is, I mean, they scored a couple late garbage-time touchdowns, but they – they look bad on offense, and I'm not ready to have that conversation about are they done yet. I'll have that conversation in week 17, week 16 in the playoffs. You know, they're they're 10 and two. Uh, I'm not worried about them right now. Sean Watson, man, have a game. Three thrown touchdowns, one ca- caught touchdown from DeAndre Hopkins. Just amazing stuff. Honestly, uh, that was great gameplay, and like you said, the. The Texans were at, uh, were in charge of that game the entire way through. It felt like I mean, New England put up thirteen in the fourth quarter, but it was it was all the uh, Houston and just Deshaun Watson played great that game against a really tough defense. And then wrapping up the wrapping up week thirteen, we have the Seattle Seahawks beating the Minnesota Vikings thirty seven to thirty. That was a pretty entertaining game. But just another one for narratives that continue. Russell Wilson continues to win primetime games. Kirk Cousins continues to lose them, even though it's obviously a team effort. He had a chance at the end, but the Seahawks come up with the important victory and now move into first place in the division, knocking the San Francisco 49ers all the way down to the five seed and keeping really the rest of the the other two, you know, two or three teams, the Bears and Rams, alive in the wild card uh in the wild card race, even though they're still, they still need a lot of help. The Seahawks win was big for basically the rest of the NFC. Yeah, that was a big win for them. And I can't believe they're at top of the NFC West now. It just feels so weird with how well the 49ers have played. 
and how like Seattle's played so many close games. Seattle nearly lost to Bengals week one, nearly lost to the Steelers right after that. It's just it, it's incredible for Seattle to be where they're at. Uh, to be honest, they're a very lucky team. I feel, but um, really just kind of crazy stuff. And like you said, the thing with Kirk Cousins continues that narrative that he's bad on prime time just he can't shake it it wasn't even his fault but like he just can't win he's 0-8 on Monday Night Football like that's terrible Russell Wilson meanwhile has the best winning percentage among anybody who started 10 games on Monday Night Football and in third place in winning percentage is Ben Roethlisberger who's 14 and 4 just wanted to point that out nice so that wraps up week 13 in the NFL let's get to some Steelers news Uh, Really, the only thing notable is that Marquise Pouncey has finished serving his two-game suspension and has been placed on the exempt commissioner's permission list, basically giving the team two days to open up a roster spot for him. And they've already done that. They've waived Patrick Morris, uh, the backup center. Uh, It's not known at this time if he'll return to the practice squad, but I think that's a pretty safe bet. I think think, uh, he'll return. All right, into NFL news, we already talked about Gardner Minshew and Nick Foles, but, man, that Nick Foles contract – my goodness, uh, I think it was $55 million guaranteed this year. What do you do? It's going to sting, but like, you probably just cut him after this year. I don't know how much is guaranteed after, but just it's you got to eat it, I feel like. I feel like it just wasn't worth it. I just, I don't know. This is the worst contract maybe in the history of football right now. You think the Kirk Cousins deal is bad? That looks like a steal compared to this right now. Honestly, yeah. My my goodness, what a situation. Thank God we don't have that problem. The Denver Broncos defensive end Derek Wolf has been placed on IR. He was having a career year with seven sacks uh, in a contract season for him, too, so you hate to see that for the guy. He's one of the holdovers from that 15 championship team. Yeah, man. It's one of the last ones that he's going to be probably leaving after this. The New England Patriots have waived their fourth kicker, Kai Forbath, just less than three days after he signed with the team. You might be thinking, oh boy, what for? But the reason is they'll be re-signing Nick Folk, who had an appendectomy last week. So, you know, just shuffling out kickers. But he did miss an extra point uh, on Sunday night, I believe. Kai Forbath did. Yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Another thing that's kind of surprising, the Cincinnati Bengals have activated wide receiver John Ross off of injured reserve. Meanwhile, A.J. Green is still not playing. Uh, kind of, it is kind of crazy. I guess I really, I, I guess I really do need wide receivers. So it was fun to bring John Ross back, and now you have a pretty solid set of three with Auden Tate, Tyler Boyd, and him. But I don't know, man. Like, it just feels weird to bring him back for this year when like the year's over. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're hoping to gain by that, and not playing AJ Green at the same time. It's kind of bizarre. But you have some uh, clinching scenarios. You want to run those over for us? Sure. So the Saints just clinched last week. They're the first team to clinch. Uh, There are now four new teams that can clinch this week, as well as the 49ers and Patriots, uh, which were able to clinch last week. So the first new one, Ravens can clinch the division with a Baltimore win and Pittsburgh loss, or a Baltimore tie and Pittsburgh loss. Uh, Then uh, they clinch the playoffs just by winning. Uh, and some uh, there's some other uh, convoluted w- ways they could involving tie- if they lose and then there's a tie or they tie and something like that. A bunch of other ways, but those aren't likely. Uh, Bills can also clinch with a win. Oakland loss or tie. Houston loss. Indianapolis loss or tie. And then th- that's what makes them clinch the playoffs. Chiefs can clinch the AFC West division with a win and an Oakland loss. Seahawks can clinch the playoffs with a win or tie. Then uh, New England can clinch a playoff berth uh, with a win. Uh, And then there's some other convoluted scenarios involving ties. And then uh, 49ers clinch a playoff berth with a win and uh, Los Angeles Rams loss or tie. Or if they tie and lose. So those are all the clinching scenarios for this week. All righty then. Uh, Thursday night football this week. Two teams that played on Thanksgiving. They get a full week of rest for this Thursday night game. It's Cowboys and Bears. Chicago is at home. Right now, Pigs can pick them. Just updated their line. It's Chicago plus two and a half. So Dallas is getting two and a half points on the road. Two six and six teams. One of them is a far cry from the playoffs. One of them is leading their division. Oh, my. Hey, they're both bowl eligible. They're both bowl eligible. Ew. 
Uh, I'm going to pick the Cowboys to cover in this game. I don't have faith in the Bears. I do have faith in the Cowboys' offense. So I'm going to pick the Cowboys to cover here. The weather in the Northeast has been not very nice the last few days, and I'm going to bet on the fact that Soldier Field is typically a terrible place to play this time of year for the road team. Uh, The Bears' offense is by no means high-flying, and the high-flying Cowboys' offense, I'm going to predict, is going to get stymied a bit by the natural elements playing into the hands of the Bears. So I'm going to take the Bears to win this game straight up and obviously uh, plus the two-and-a-half points there. So give me the Bears, and uh, you know, hopefully it'll be a better game than I'm worried that it's going to turn out. I hope so, too. All right, that just leaves us with a couple of things to get to. Uh, Is it time to start thinking about Mike Tomlin as a coach of the year candidate? Because I think that there's a lot of really good possibilities. Guys like John Gruden with the Raiders, guys like Kyle Shanahan with the San Francisco 49ers, John Harbaugh with the Ravens. But I think Mike Tomlin certainly can stake a claim to that uh, to that award, possibly based on how the rest of the year goes. Seven and five in the playoffs as of right now on your number three quarterback missing your starting running back for most of the season, missing your starting uh, wide receiver, number one wide receiver and running back for most of the, or not most of, but part of the year. I think this has been by far his finest coaching effort. And I said that at the time, that this was going to be the most important test for Mike Tomlin once he lost Ben Roethlisberger. And so far he's passed with flying colors. So far he's done really, really well. Uh, I think that he should be part of that conversation for coach of the year. Uh, I, I don't know if he should be the front runner. I kind of like Kyle Shanahan uh, for this year. But, I mean, with doing what he's done with how much he's lost with injuries with a third-string quarterback, with a second-string quarterback, it's just uh, it's been incredible stuff. So I think that he should be amongst the conversation. I think he could be I think he could be the runner-up. I think he's the second-best option, if I'm being honest, only behind Kyle Shanahan. He's not going to win it if the Steelers don't make the playoffs. I think for him to win it, the Steelers need to make the playoffs and maybe make some noise in the playoffs. Oh yeah, for sure. But I, one thing that is nice, and I've, you know, we've both been critical of him in the past, but he's also earned it. I, it is nice seeing him get the credit that he does deserve, though, because I heard Pat McAfee this morning say that he was the most underrated coach of all time, which is really interesting because, you know. 11 months ago, he was, uh, he, that's not what we were saying about him. Uh, not at all. But, <sighs> but uh, it's nice to see him getting the credit that he deserves this year. Another guy that is, should get a lot of credit for the way he's performed this year is Jordan Berry. As of right now, he, heard, he holds the third best punting average in team history for a single season at 46.1 yards, trailing Bobby Joe Green, also better known as Bobby Walden, for the team record of 47 yards by, you know, less than a full yard. His 41.3 net yards per punt return would be a team record if it stands. Now, a few things to note. The net average has gone up substantially since Bobby Walden was punting. So, you know, that's one thing to take into account. Another is that the weather is going to be bad and, you know, net average and uh, punting average is going to go down over the next few games. And obviously Barry's had more room to boot it this year, whereas, you know, the last few years he's been punting from, you know, deep in up either in opponent's territory or at midfield trying to pin teams, so he hasn't been able to boom it as much. But all that being said, you can't argue that Jordan Barry is having his best season. He has been, you know, we've said he's been very good, but now, you know, being able to do it for as long as he's done it, he's been elite. There's no other way to put it. He has been a weapon for the Steelers this year, and it's been very very nice to see because we haven't seen that in a long time that's been very well needed too just with how bad the offense has been you need a guy that could flip the field in that sense so uh he's been very good at a very opportune time and also credit to the coverage team as well uh we know i know that we've seen some slip-ups from Artie burns and johnny holton at times this year but for the most part they've done their job and that net yards per punt return is a team stat because it's not just on the punting it's on the coverage team and they've all done a good job so far Oh, yeah, for sure. Alrighty then, uh, any further thoughts? I think uh, we're good to wrap this one up for now. I'm good. All right, the Steelers play in Arizona next week at 425, and we'll be talking about that game on the next episode. But in the meantime, if you have any questions about the show, please feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. Check out our website, strongerthansteelnfl.blogspot.com. You can find our episodes posted on SoundCloud and YouTube. And you can also find our various social media platforms like Twitter 
and Instagram and Facebook found on our website as well. Austin, thank you so much for joining me today. And Steelers Nation, thank you for listening. Everyone have a terrific day and uh, go Steelers. Bye. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. And don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.